the best test used to diagnose a traumatic brain injury? I'm Joe Lamb with Joe Knows Brains, and today we're going to talk about which imaging studies are most effective in diagnosing traumatic brain injuries and concussions, and kind of explaining why, while MRIs may be the most common, they may not be the best at diagnosing a TBI at the outset. Um, this is going to be the start of a couple different videos discussing the post-accident tests that are used. There's three different main types of tests. The first is imaging, and then there's what's known as the Glasgow Coma Scale, which I'll talk about in another video. And finally, there's some uh, neurocognitive testing that's more based on, um, it's essentially a quiz. So if you like quizzes, which everyone does, um, make sure to tune into the that one. Um, so looking at imaging tests, the, the main types of imaging that is done in today's, in modern medicine, there's MRIs, CT scans slash x-rays, they're basically the same um, concept, and, and SPECT P, uh, PET scans. And then uh, a special test we're gonna talk about today is um, VNG testing or uh, video nystomography. So turning first to MRIs, these are very common, uh, commonly used to diagnose soft tissue injuries throughout the body. For example, um, if an athlete injures their knee or ankle, they're gonna have an MRI done. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Um, it's actually uh, technically NMRI, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Um, just a fun little factoid. These were discovered around the time that nuclear power was first being developed, and the people who created MRIs were terrified that the use of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging was going to make people never want to have this test, thinking that they were going to get radiation poisoning. The funny part is, is the nuclear in, in NMRI refers to the nucleus of an atom, not nuclear in the way of it's going to blow up and kill us all. So they're actually incredibly safe tests. Um, they do a great job of indicating damages to the soft tissue of the body. Unfortunately, a regular MRI has some issues in terms of diagnosing a TBI. And what that is, is, is that the MRI does a poor job of indicating the white matter in the brain and showing injuries and damage to that white matter. Now that's because essentially, um, TBIs present at a very low level of detail. So just because you have an MRI done doesn't mean that it's going to be conclusive evidence that anything's happened to the brain. What they do a great job of is ruling out subdural hematomas, as I've discussed in other videos, and ruling out other kind of acute concerns that, that are going to cause injury there and then in the, um, in the hospital. Um, this is actually also why CT scans are heavily used. I, I'll talk about them briefly just here. Um, they do a great job of indicating bone damage also for acute injuries. Um, for MRIs, uh, this is often the most common first test given. It's at the hospital. But there's actually a couple different techniques that are being implemented these days to make MRIs more reliable when when doing imaging studies on someone who suffered a traumatic brain injury. The first is what's known as MRI with diffusion tensor imaging or an MRI DTI. This is fantastic for visualizing the brain's white matter. And it's often correlated with the symptomology presented by the patient. In fact, this is kind of an interesting side note. Um, all of the best radiologists that I work with say very similar things along the lines of, the MRI will never tell the whole story. It has to be correlated with the patient's symptomology. And the same is true for an MRI DTI. Just because there's a change or no change in the diffusion tensor imaging does not mean that an injury hasn't occurred. It does not mean that an injury has occurred. It's just evidence that can be correlated with the patient's symptoms in order to make an educated decision for the doctors. Um, the MRI DTI uh, is able to show the axons of the brain cells in order to determine if there's any kind of white matter tract injury. Um, it does this very interestingly, looking at the movement of water molecules through the brain's matter. So this is a great way. These are actually a very common MRI used when you see the, the brain MRIs used in, in scientific studies. Quite often those are in not regular MRIs, but they're MRIs with the diffusion tensor imaging or MRI DTI. Um, it's particularly useful in recognizing these diffuse axonal injuries that are the basis for so much of the neurocognitive decline following a brain injury. Um, so oftentimes something may be difficult or impossible to visualize in an MRI that can be seen on an MRI DTI. Another common type of MRI uh, 
used to diagnose brain injuries is what's called an MRI with neuroquant. Now, technically, this is just an MRI. The neuroquant isn't some kind of different element to the imaging test. It is a statistical analysis of the volume of certain segments of the brain weighted against a statistically normal person of that same age group. For example, uh, an MRI neuroquant will look at the prefrontal cortex's volume, which is just an MRI looking at that and determine the volume of the prefrontal cortex, compare that to a standardized volume of someone of the same gender and age. And, and through that methodology, they're able to notice if there's been damage or cellular loss, necrosis, at any of these levels. Um, generally, the neuroquant TBI is, in my opinion, when working with clients, more reliable and reveals more. However, there are a lot of radiologists and neurologists that swear by the neuroquant system. And because I'm not a radiologist or neurologist, I'm not here to tell them otherwise. Um, another type of MRI that can be used is a, a functional MRI, which is not quite as common, but what it does is it shows blood flow throughout the brain. This can be fantastic for, as mentioned, subdural hematomas, any kind of uh, loss of oxyg oxygenation within the brain. So if you've got someone who's been, um, has asphyxiation or any kind of oxygen loss, especially in stroke patients, this can be a really effective MRI to determine exactly what areas are being impacted. For, from a TBI perspective, it doesn't reveal as much as we see from a stroke or asphyxiation perspective, but it is utilized and it is another method used to determine a brain injury. Um, and nowadays, they're even beginning to have 3D MRIs. What these do is, is they create, um, you get an image that reveals different levels of the brain in relationship to each other. This takes, because it's, there's no such thing as a true 3D MRI, it takes so many sections of the brain all the way through and then takes those and brings them back together to create a 3D model of the MRI. Uh, and, and this allows the radiologist to manipulate the image much more effectively. Uh, it allows them to look at overlying structures and, um, and see kind of the interaction at different levels. It, it provides much more detail than a standard MRI, even though it really is just a bunch of standard MRIs. In fact, many standard MRIs these days are actually 3D MRIs. Um, it's just as the technology improves, the ability for radiologists to analyze the data is rapidly improving. Uh, the next type of scans that I'm gonna talk about, nowhere near as effective as MRIs, are actually CT scans. Um, unfortunately, only about 10 to 15% of traumatic brain injuries are detectable by CT scans. Um, that means 85% of TBIs are going undiagnosed on CT scans. Unfortunately, um, while MRIs are becoming more and more common, CT scans and x-rays are still the first and oftentimes only imaging study done at the hospital to rule out acute injury. So that means that quite often 85% of individuals who have suffered a TBI go undiagnosed. It's my hope that as information around brain and brain injuries continues to develop, um, that number is going to go up and, and hopefully CT scans while having a very effective use in ruling out acute injury to the, uh, to the skull, uh, they, 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 they are quite too often the only imaging test used. Um, and what a CT scan is, is just a fancy x-ray because a CT scan is just a series of x-rays taken from different angles. Um, personally, I'm not sure where the distinction, why it went from x-ray to CT. Um, it, it, to me, it's just an evolution of the technology. Uh, many people think they're distinct, uh, different tests, but it turns out really a CT scan is just a bunch of x-rays from different angles. Um, and, and in reality, um, an MRI with DTI, heck, even a regular MRI is going to do a lot better job of showing damage to the brain than a CT scan. Um, the next is uh, an interesting one called the SPECT scan. Um, it's essentially uh, a, a map of the blood supply, and it's premised on the fact that a damaged area of the brain will have blood flow and be impaired very similar to a functional MRI. And again, most often used in determining in, in strokes. These scans are very, they, while is this an effective scan, it's a very uncommon scan um, and the technology is still being developed. The same is true uh, for PET scans. It's a PET scan. It measures glucose metabolism. Uh, and, and the hypothesis with this is, is that if the brain is damaged, there'll be an impaired usage of the glucose metabolism in the brain. 
Um, while these scans, again, these PET scans, in my opinion, they do a fantastic job of showing the active and inactive part, portions of the brain. What they don't do is show white matter injury, which some would argue is or is not all uh, indicative in all brain injuries. But at the same time, they're also much more rare. And sometimes it can be difficult to, um, to obtain by one of these PET scans. Um, and, and in reality, the, the PET scans are most often used in um, determining the long-term treatment for an individual who's suffered some kind of brain injury, be it traumatic brain injury, stroke, or otherwise. Um, the last test I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be uh, what's known as VNG, or video nystagmography testing. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a hybrid. It's not totally an imaging test. It's somewhat of a neurocognitive test, which I'll talk about more, but it's a really interesting one, so I wanted to include it on this video. Um, but this, this test, VNG, uh, a patient sits in a dark room with these high-tech goggles on and it tracks the eye movements as the eye follows certain stimuli. And, and it's really fascinating. Um, on my next video, I'll show a, an example of this, which, which shows the track. Because what you'll see is, is the eye is basically supposed to go in a circle. But it, it's quite often, it, it really shocked um, the res researchers who first discovered this. Because even with a, a small concussion, uh, I'm sorry, even with just a concussion, um, you can see from that common circle, it, it, the, the eye starts shaking start, it, and it's clear as day. It, it, it's mind blowing how significant this test can show a TBI occurred. Now it does have some false positives and it doesn't reveal which type of brain injury an individual has suffered. For example, if someone with Alzheimer's or dementia was to take this test, that's never suffered a brain injury. They're very likely to get a positive result. So in that way, this test is not 100% effective, but it's a really neat one. And I just realized I don't have any examples of it. So I'll talk more about it on my next video. Um, so that really leaves multiple different types of tests that are used for TBIs. Which one is the best? Well, it really depends on what is what, what the answer we're looking for is. If we're looking to see if there's blood loss to the brain, a functional MRI or a SPECT scan, those are gonna be the best ones. If you're looking with a stroke, then you're gonna to wanna to look for another blood loss functional MRI. When trying to diagnose concussions or MTBIs, it's my opinion that a DTI MRI is, is the gold standard. It's gonna show the white matter tract injuries. However, in reality, and any and, um, from a treatment perspective, doctors will use a combination of these tests in order to rule out certain mechanisms of injury and, and determine based on the symptomology of the patient and the imaging tests, exactly what's going on. Um, quite often, I see video nystagmography testing used in conjunction with MRI DTIs and what I'll talk about more next time, which is neurocognitive testing in order to determine which areas of the brain are injured and, and how best to treat those and isolate the specific problem that's going on. Um, so really, as always, if you feel that you've suffered some kind of brain injury, make sure to first check out, um, go, go, go get yourself checked out of the emergency room, see a doctor. And if you're ever um, trying to determine if you're having ongoing symptoms, we are always happy to provide our symptom checklist for TBIs as shown here on the screen. Um, it's at the link below. And you know, um, you'd be shocked at how many people come into our office um, that have been in a bad car or bicycle accident, hit their head and say, I'm fine. And then fill out the symptom form and they've got seven, eight of these checked out and then begin seeing a neurologist who determines, you know, You've got ongoing symptoms from this uh, concussion you suffered. So we're always trying to make sure everyone gets the best treatment possible and, and provide the most education about brains because um, if you're like me, you find this stuff really fascinating. So thank you guys um, and see you next time.